Hey Rockpoint, thanks for joining us online this weekend. As always, it's a joy to be able to worship Jesus with you across space and time. No matter where you are or when you're watching, I'm glad you've tuned in. Now it's the beginning of Lent, a season of fasting and soul searching, but I'm hoping it's also a season of growth and of new life for you personally and for the church around the world. Today, Phil is joining us with musical worship. Then Stephanie will have our news and updates. Ryan will bring us information on our Compassion Fund, and I'll be back with a Lent challenge for the week. We'll round things off with Todd, who has this week's message on celebration. A version of this message will be live at all sites this weekend, including my version at Bear's Paw. So if you bounce back and forth between online and in person, you don't have to worry about catching the same sermon twice in a row. And with all that said, let's pray and get into it. Jesus. Today, my prayer is simply that you meet us in a new way and that we would not be unchanged by that experience. Transform us into your image and help us to live the lives that you would have us live. We love you and we honor you today. Amen. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Your righteousness like the mighty mountains, yeah, your justice flows like the ocean's tide, and I will lift my high voice to worship you. I will find my high strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the skies your righteousness is like the mighty mountains oh your justice flows like the ocean's tide And I will lift my high voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my high strength in the shadow of your wings. And I will lift my voice to Worship you, my King. And I will find my high strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the skies. You were the young at all. You were the young at all. 
from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things. And to you are all things. You deserve the glory. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, God, and I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves. When my heart becomes free and my shame is undone, Your presence, Lord. And fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Taste it and see of the sweetest of loves. When my heart becomes free and my shame is undone, Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest. Of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord, and Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness This place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for 
to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Hey everyone, Stephanie here with this weekend's announcements. If you haven't already signed up for our weekly newsletter, you can do so on our website, rockpoint.ca. In the newsletter, you'll find information on all our upcoming events, devotional thoughts from our pastoral staff, and any updates that you may need. And if you have any questions, comments, or prayer requests, our digital connect card can get you in touch with the person on staff most able to meet your need. You can find it at rockpoint.ca slash contact or by scanning this QR code. With all that said, let's get to the announcements. We have some exciting new details about the candidating weekend coming up. To begin, all Rock Pointers are invited to gather with the candidate and his family on Friday, March 1st at Bearspaw from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. We'll be hearing his story and learning about his family, but it'll also be a great opportunity for him to learn about us, our history as a church, our people, our sites, and the things we are praying for. This will be a great evening together, and we would love to see anyone who calls Rock Point home to be there. This evening also serves as a chance for any Rock Pointer who cannot make it to the weekend service to have a chance to get to know the candidate. Next, both our Saturday and Sunday Bowridge congregations will be gathering on Saturday night at 5.15 for a chilly dinner in the Bowridge Fireside Room. This is a chance for our Bowridge congregation to hear from and interact with our candidate. Immediately following, we will hold our Bowridge Saturday night service with our candidate preaching. Then our Bear Spa congregation will have the chance to show up early at 8.45 a.m. for some time with the candidate. Immediately following is our normal 10 a.m. Bear Spa service with our candidate preaching. Our West Hills congregation will hold their normal 10.30 service with our candidate preaching, and then afterwards, from 11.45 to 12.30 in the Ambrose Gym, have a time to interact with the candidate. We hope each of you can make one of these gatherings work. If you forget the times or locations, don't worry. We have all this info in our weekly newsletter. One more thing. You may be asking, well, who is this person? Our Rock Point elders, the candidate, and the sending church elders have been working together to establish the best time to let their church community know. That will be the February 24th and 25th weekend, so you can expect to hear more information on our candidate that same weekend. One final reminder that the 55 Connect community is coming together for a time of games, snacks, and visiting on February 23rd at 10 a.m. at Bearspa. There's no cost, but there is a deadline to register for the Crokinole Tournament, so head to the website for more details. That's all for me today. Have a great week, Rock Point. Well, hey everybody, it's Ryan here once again with another financial video, just an overview of all of our funds over the last while. And today it's all about our Compassion Fund. So first of all, what is our Compassion Fund? Well, there's big needs, there's small needs all over our world, all over the city of Calgary, Cochrane. In fact, there's needs right here at Rock Point in this body too. So this is a fund specifically for that addressing the needs that we see and helping those who have those needs. And so this is a restricted fund, meaning that anything that you give to this fund is only going to be used for those purposes. The monies in this fund don't find their way anywhere else. Now, what kind of needs are addressed with this fund? Actually, it could be a great many things. From helping somebody with gas or groceries or rent, all the way to partnering with maybe schools or other charitable organizations who have a similar vision as us in helping those with needs. Now, it could be people outside of Rock Point. Maybe they just wander in and need some help. Somebody we know on our street. Or it could be people from inside the body who find themselves in need. Now, Rock Point is known across Calgary and Cochrane as a church that really cares, as a church that actually steps in. What a blessing that is, and our Compassion Fund and our Compassion Team has been instrumental in this. So, what a blessing it is to have a fund like this and a team that drives it and manages it. And speaking of that team, what an essential team this is. So, just know that when you give to the Compassion Fund, there's a team in place to triage requests, to test the legitimacy of these requests, and actually to manage how money is expended and how needs are met. So it's amazing that we have such a great team to manage this for us as well. Now, where are we currently at with this fund? Actually, we're in a surplus position still. We were when we started the fiscal year in July 1st of 2023, and we still are. 
But here's an important thing to know. Actually, in the last about seven months, we have expended $92,000 through this fund, which is unbelievable. So many people have been helped through this fund. Giving remains strong and we're still in a great surplus position. So I hope that you always give something to the Compassion Fund and thank you for doing so. Hope this helps give you an idea of what this fund is all about. Hey Rock Point, welcome to the first Sunday of Lent 2024. If Lent is a new thing for you, let me give you a quick rundown. Lent is the season in the church calendar that leads up to Easter. It is 40 days of preparing our hearts and spirits to celebrate Christ's victory over sin and death. It begins on Ash Wednesday, which we observed earlier this week, and it ends on Holy Saturday, the day before Easter. During this time, Christians around the world lean into three spiritual disciplines, fasting, giving, and prayer. We will explore each of these disciplines in more detail in the weeks ahead, so don't worry if you're not sure how you can apply these to your life right now. If Lent is not new to you, I want to invite you to lean into the rhythm of Lent. We observe the Lenten disciplines from Monday to Saturday, and then we pause on Sunday to celebrate God's goodness and Jesus' resurrection. This gives us 40 days of fasting and six days of feasting, 40 days of challenge and six of celebration. Now, in the past, I've often viewed Lent as a season of scouring, of gritting my teeth while I try to ignore my cravings for sugar or my desire to fill my time with music and podcasts and noise. But this year, I feel God calling Rock Point to instead use this season to seek out Jesus. Some of that may be challenging, but in a culture that idolizes comfort, willingly taking on some discomfort is actually our act of rebellion against a world that wants to lull us away from God. To that end, each week, I'm going to give you a challenge, and I encourage all of us to lean into that challenge. It will likely take some time and effort, but so does all change. If your spiritual life is perfect already, then feel free to let these challenges pass you by. But if you're looking to get more out of your walk these days, get involved. Take a risk. See what happens. Today, my challenge is simple. Take time this week to think and pray on what are the things that are keeping you from spending more time with Jesus. Write them down. Share them with your spouse or a trusted friend or a family member. They may be sins or they may be distractions, but whatever they are, get them down. We'll come back to them next week. For me, I have too many hobbies and I often am tempted to think more about my pastimes than about my savior. So now I've shared this spiritual roadblock with all of you, so I'll be ready for next week's challenge. Now a quick word before I let you go. Participating in Lent is not going to make God love you more. Nothing you do can earn more of God's love. He already loves you completely. It's also not a magical answer to all of the problems you may be facing. It's more like a spiritual workout. For many of us, we've allowed our spiritual muscles to weaken, but we're in a new season of growth here at Rock Point, and I'm inviting everyone to join in that growth by spending more time with Jesus and less time on the things that don't really matter. So, Rock Point, let's grow together. friends. It is good to be with you today. My name is Todd. I am one of the worship pastors here at Rock Point Church at our West Hill site. And accordingly, normally when you'd see me here on our online services, it would be leading some musical worship, but not today. Today I have the great privilege of getting to speak with you and open God's Word together. Um, if you've been following along with us, we're in the midst of a series on the book of Exodus, and we've been calling it the glory of God revealed. And the reason we chose that title is because Exodus is a book in which 
God makes his glory known in incredible ways. It's a book in which God really pulls out all the stops and shows us who he is in dramatic fashion. He reveals himself in all kinds of ways. He reveals himself through his mighty deeds of judgment and deliverance. He reveals himself through these incredible theophanies or visible manifestations of his presence. He reveals himself through his own self-disclosure. He tells Moses his name, uh, which he gives as Yahweh, I am who I am. And he reveals himself in giving the law, his instructions to his chosen people, Israel, on how they are to uphold their end of this covenantal relationship that they've entered into with him. Now, up to this point in scripture, you know, we've come to know about God uh, in different ways, often you know, more vaguely and in bits and pieces, but here in Exodus, God pulls back the curtain and he lets us right in on the divine mystery, both through the things that he says and through the things that he does. It's an incredible book, probably the most important book in all the Old Testament. You know, for the Jewish people throughout the ages, Exodus is foundational to their self-understanding, how they see themselves, how they came to be, how God brought them out of slavery, made them a people. And constantly, as you continue through the Bible, Exodus is being hearkened back to through the rest of the story as this template for how God brings his salvation. Now, it's a big book. Um, a lot happens. And because we can't have this series lasting two years, we've had to pick and choose uh, which aspects of the book of Exodus we've looked at in our time together. But I hope that in your personal time reading the scriptures, maybe over the next couple weeks, you will take the opportunity to read through all or part of the book of Exodus on your own and to see the incredible ways that God reveals himself in it. And it's so important because as we've been saying throughout the series, beholding God's glory is transformational. It says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, which has been kind of a guiding verse through this series, it says, as we contemplate God's glory, the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Now there's something transformative about seeing God, about beholding Him, contemplating who He is, that changes us. Indeed, I think it's the only thing that really does change us in a permanent, um, lasting way. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a great deal of changing that I still need to happen in my heart, ways in which I need to be transformed into the image of Christ. And so as we begin today, as we open God's word, let us pray that the Spirit would give us eyes to see, that we would behold something together of the glory of God as we open his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time. Thank you for the privilege of opening up your word uh, and having it impact us, having it change our hearts. And we pray, God, that it would do just that, that it would yield the fruit that you want it to yield. Help us to see who you are today and to be transformed by what we see. We pray this in Jesus' name, knowing that it's his will for us. Amen. Amen. Okay. Our passage today uh, is from Exodus 23, which is just in the back half of the book. Exodus has 40 chapters, and the laws of math being what they are, that puts us in the back half. The book of Exodus can be divided roughly in two. Uh, the first half is all action, and it describes you know, the well-known story, the plight of the people of Israel as they're in slavery in Egypt under the tyrannical and despotic rule of Pharaoh. And it shows how God sees their misery and he hears their cries of anguish and slavery and he springs into action on their behalf. First, he miraculously protects this little baby, Moses, who would grow to be God's chosen instrument. And he sets him on this course, which would see him raised, you know, in this great turn of irony in the very household of Pharaoh, out of harm's way and uniquely positioned to have an audience with the king. And God later, as when Moses has grown up, he reveals himself to him and he commissions him 
to go and deliver his people. He gives him a message for Pharaoh, the iconic demand, let my people go. But we see Pharaoh's unwillingness to relinquish his slaves and the repeated hardening of his heart. And so in response, God unleashes a series of terrible plagues, judgments on Egypt, demonstrating his surpassing greatness over the things that the Egyptians worshipped. And Pharaoh, he finally wilts under the pressure and he lets the people go. But then once again, he changes his mind, he hardens his heart and musters his chariots and pursues Moses and the Israelites all the way to the Red Sea where God would finally orchestrate his final climactic act of judgment on Pharaoh and his slave masters. And they're buried beneath the waters of the Red Sea. And God brings his newly liberated people out the other side. And then guided by God's presence, they make their way through the desert to the foot of Mount Sinai, where God first appeared to Moses. And it's the place that he's chosen Uh, for the Israelites to come and to worship him. And that's the first half of the book. Everything that leads up to the arrival of the people of God at Mount Sinai. And then the second half, it concerns what happens once they get there. In Exodus 19, they finally arrive. It's taken them three months journey uh, to reach Mount Sinai. But they arrive and they camp there. About two million people in all gathered at the foot of Mount Sinai. And God gives them this message. He says, you saw what I did to the Egyptians. You've seen what I can do. And even though the whole earth is mine, I have set you apart to be my holy people, my treasured possession. And so it's very important that you do what I say. And the people respond, yes, God, absolutely. We'll do whatever you say. And then this amazing thing happens. God descends The presence of God descends on Mount Sinai in fire and in a thick cloud full of thunder and lightning and there's a trumpet blast that grows louder and louder and louder and the whole mountain trembles violently and they hear, the whole people of Israel hear the voice of God speaking to them. And this whole ordeal was so terrifying to them that they begged Moses, please, Moses, don't let God speak to us anymore. You speak to him. If he speaks to us, we'll die. And so Moses alone draws near to the mountain and he hears the words of the Lord and God gives him the law. So that's where we're at in our passage. That's the context. God is giving the law to the people of Israel out of a mountain wreathed in fire and smoke. And you know, in that context, it's maybe a little surprising what we have here. You know, in that context, we might expect something more like the first words that God speaks from the fire, the words of the Ten Commandments. And he begins by saying, I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You know, that feels right. That feels appropriate to the gravitas of the circumstances. But after having said that and other things, God goes on to say, this too I command you. Have some parties. Yeah, that's right. Three times a year, I want you to celebrate, and you're going to throw a great big do, and everybody's going to come. Thus saith the Lord. What's this about? Why would God command them to celebrate these festivals, these parties? Well, it really brings us back to the question of what is the law? You know, often when we think about the law of Moses, and Nathaniel did a great job speaking about this a few weeks ago when he addressed the topic of the law, what is the law? Well, it's really natural for us to think that the law is about getting right with God, that it's really about personal salvation. But really, as Nathaniel explained, there's a lot more going on than that. You know, here's Israel, this newly formed people. Now, they're fresh out of 400 years of slavery. And all of a sudden, they're liberated. They're brought out of the land that has been their home since time out of mind and made into a new nation. How are they going to organize themselves? How are they going to go about living together as a community? I mean, how are they going to go about things like justice? 
What if someone steals someone something or mistreats someone? You know, what if, for instance, someone's ox gets out and accidentally gores an, their neighbor? Well, in the law, it covers all this and more. God lays it all out. There are laws concerning all these aspects of living together as a community. There are laws about the treatment of foreigners. There are laws about loan forgiveness. You know, and a big part of the law is God instructing the people of Israel on what kind of a nation they're going to be. They're not going to model themselves, God says, after the Egyptians. Nor are they going to follow the example of the nations living in the land where God is leading them. They're not to be like other nations. They're to be different. And because Israel has this unique calling, they have the unique privilege of being holy to the Lord, set apart for him. Israel is God's special people, his treasured possession, he calls them, chosen by him, delivered out of slavery by his hand. You know, and this, this special role of Israel, it goes all the way back to the beginning when God first called Abraham, the father of the Israelites, and he made these incredible promises to him. He said this in Genesis 12, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt and all the families on the earth, all the nations on the earth will be blessed through you. God's plan was not just about freeing and oppressed people. It wasn't just about their personal liberation from slavery and hardship. It was bigger than that. It was about making them a blessing to all the families of the earth. Israel was called to be the light of the world to all these nations who knew nothing of God. I mean, shortly before this, not even Israel really knew much about God. But when Moses came and he spoke to Pharaoh and he said, this is what the Lord says, let my people go. Pharaoh's response was, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. And you know, the same could be said of every other nation on earth at the time. They did not know the Lord, but Israel had the special privilege of being the one people on the face of the earth who really knew God. And not only that, but the presence of God went with them wherever they went. So they had this unique calling. They were to safeguard and hold and treasure the knowledge of the one true God, to be his representatives on the earth. It's an incredible calling. I mean, what a privilege. But the question was this. How is Israel alone among all the nations who did, not, who did not know God, who held to different value systems, who were telling different stories, who practiced different religions, often very abominable religions, detestable religions, how is Israel alone in the midst of all this going to stay true to her calling? How were God's people going to stay rooted in their story, the real story, the story that God was writing. And so our passage today is really an answer to that question. It's part of God's solution. And this was how they were to do it. They were to celebrate, to feast, to have parties. We'll read it together uh, from Exodus 23. It says this, God commanded, three times a year you are to celebrate a festival to me. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. For seven days eat bread made without yeast as I commanded you. Do this at the appointed time in the month of Aviv, for in that month you came out of Egypt. No one is to appear before me empty-handed. Now celebrate the festival of harvest with the first fruits of the crops you sow in your field. Celebrate the festival of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in your crops from the field. Three times a year, all the men are to appear before the sovereign Lord. Do not offer the blood of a sacrifice to me along with anything containing yeast. The fat of my festival offerings must not be kept until morning. Bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. So, 
three times a year. They were to go up to the city of God, eventually, once they were settled in the land. Once in the spring, to remember the Passover. Once in the early summer, when the first fruits of the harvest came in. And then once in the fall, when they had finished gathering everything up from the harvest. Every single Israelite male would be required to go up to the temple and bring a sacrifice. No one was to appear before the Lord empty-handed. And they would burn the sacrifice, the fat portions of the sacrifice to the Lord as an offering. They would have this big communal meal uh, with the rest, with what was left over. And they would do this as a way of reenacting their history. For example, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they would act out this dramatic story of how God had delivered them, how because of the blood of the lamb that was smeared on the doorpost, the angel of death had passed over the houses of the Israelites as he swept through Egypt. And they would eat bread without yeast to remind them of how they left Egypt in a hurry. They couldn't even take time to leaven their bread. Uh, they would eat bitter herbs to remind them of the bitterness of their time of slavery. These festivals were these ways of remembering who they are, how they'd become a people, what God had done for them, what he continued to do for them in the, his provision for them. They were a way of returning to and living into the story of who they were and who God is. See, God is very smart. I don't know if you do that, but he is. He's very smart. He made us, and he understands how we work. He understands our capacity to forget. You know, standing at the foot of that burning mountain and hearing this edict, the people might have wondered why this was strictly necessary. I mean, who could possibly forget all the wonders that they had seen? The plagues, the Red Sea, walled up on the right and to the left so they could walk through the middle of it. Pillars of cloud and fire leading them through the desert. The people must have been thinking, how could we ever forget this? These wonders that we have seen. But you know, the reality is they did forget. There are countless instances of this, but here's one in Hosea 13, 4 to 6, God says, But I have been the Lord your God ever since you came out of Egypt. You shall acknowledge no God but me, no Savior except me. I cared for you in the wilderness, in the land of burning heat. And when I fed them, they were satisfied. And when they were satisfied, they became proud. And when they became proud, they forgot me. This is really a central theme throughout the tragedy that is the Old Testament is God's people's capacity to forget him, their proneness to wandering away and forgetting about the God who brought them into being. It happens over and over and over, this forgetfulness. Now, I feel uniquely qualified to talk about this topic of forgetfulness because I am admittedly a forgetful person. I mean well, but it's an uphill battle. Always has been. My grandma for my whole life has called me the absent-minded professor. Um, I developed a reputation as a boy for forgetfulness. When I was young, I remember there was a year in which I lost six pairs of glasses. Um, four of them belonged to me. One of them was my brother's, one of them was my dad's. By the time I lost four of my own, I didn't want to admit to having lost another pair, so I just decided to borrow theirs instead, and then I lost them too. And, uh, you know, I found it to be really unfair too, because when you develop a reputation like this at a young age, it can be really hard to shake it as an adult, especially if you keep doing the same kind of things. Uh, just this week, I forgot about an appointment that I had. Um, I've been known to show up at the wrong place for family hikes, for instance. Um, a few weeks ago, oh, I very nearly missed my stepsister's wedding. Um, very nearly. I did make it. But, uh, you know, I like to think that it's because I'm too preoccupied with matters of great importance to pay attention to such trivialities. Whether or not that's true, I like to think it. 
And it's okay though, because I know that I'm in good company. Uh, actually, my favorite writer, G.K. Chesterton, he was famously forgetful once he took the train to a city thinking that he was lecturing there, and he got there and he found out that he was mistaken, so he telegraphed his wife. He said, am here, where ought I to be? So this is comforting to me that I'm not alone in my forgetfulness. But you know, sometimes I've forgotten far more important things than just where I happen to leave my glasses. There was a time uh, as a young man where you know, I really lost sight of who I was, of my sense of purpose um, for my life and the sense of being called by God. I, I, I lost sight of that. I, I forgot those things. And I remember in the midst of that season, a friend sent me a video by uh, Tim Mackey, if you're familiar with the Bible Project. Excuse me. It was Tim's overview of the biblical story. And as he walked through these great themes of God's creation and man's falling away and Christ's redemption, I found myself weeping. It was like my heart was reawakening to the truth that I had forgotten. And in that moment, I remembered, oh, this is my story. This is the story. This is what I'm part of and I'm caught up in. And you know, really, apart from this, there's no meaning. See, when it comes to faith, when it comes to holding on to the things of God, the reality is we don't live in a neutral territory. Just like Israel was surrounded by different people telling different stories, we live in a world that is full of competing stories, stories that compete for our attention other than the true one, the story God is writing in the world and in our lives. It forms the undercurrent, the environment of the world that we live in. You know, every time you open up social media, every time you turn on the TV, we're being confronted with stories, with value systems, with visions of the good life, the promised land that compete for our heart's attention. And they often do this in, in subtle and, and imperceptible ways, but they take hold of our imaginations and they redirect us to pursuing their goals and their ends. It is so, so easy to forget to get caught up into another story and forget God's. But it is so imperative that we don't. Because when we do, when we forget, well then we fail to live out our calling as God's people. We forfeit our responsibility of being a blessing, God's blessing to the earth. So I wanna ask you a couple or a few questions today, a few simple questions. Number one is, what story are you living into? Are you wrapped up in the story of what God is doing in the world? Has it captivated your imagination? Does it inform the way that you see the world? Does it inform your choices? Or maybe, you know, maybe you've been captivated by a different story. Maybe something else is driving you, some vision of the good life. Maybe it's accumulating possessions and wealth or being influential or successful. Maybe you haven't been bringing to God the first fruits of your harvest. Maybe there are things in your life that show that you've bought into another version of what it means to be blessed. You know, this can happen to all of us and we need an awakening. We need God to arrest our attention and we need ultimately to repent, to ask God to wake us up and to return to him. That's question one. Question two is this. What are you regularly doing to live into God's story? You know, that's one of the reasons that we gather together every week as a church is to be reminded of the story that we're in. Hebrews 10.25 says, Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but to encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. We need to regularly meet together to remember what in the world we're on this earth for. You know, that's why we gather every weekend in church. That's why we sing about, God's, about who God is. It's why we open up the scriptures together. 
you know, it's why we take communion together. Every time we take communion, we are acting out the story, the true story of Jesus, the bread of life coming down to earth, God incarnated. We can see him with our eyes. We could touch him. And we receive him into the center of our being. And he becomes the source of our new life. Of our new life. It's the gospel. And we act it out every time we partake of the Lord's Supper together. And so it's so important that we meet together. But you know, once a week meeting together, even that is insufficient. Every day we need reminding of the story that we are in. So again, I ask, what are you doing to stay anchored in the truth and to prevent your heart from straying too far? And question three, how do you celebrate God? The reality is, if you don't celebrate God, well, you're going to celebrate something else. A few short chapters after this story that we've been looking at today, or at least the passage, we find a story in which the Israelites have already forgotten God. Moses has been up on the mountain for a while, and they take matters into their own hands, and they make for themselves a golden calf, and they begin to worship it and celebrate it and dance around it. And it seems incomprehensible to us that they could so quickly turn away until we realize, oh yeah, how quickly do I go from experiencing God in my life to running after other things, serving and seeking created things rather than the creator. So we need to celebrate God. We need to not just know the truth, but delight in the truth. Not just to know that God is for us intellectually, but for this truth to actually become the source of our greatest comfort and peace. Not just to know that God loves us, but for this fact to electrify us, to thrill us, and to captivate our hearts. John Piper famously said, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Is God's love what thrills you? Or do you just go to church? There's this sonnet by the poet John Donne. It's called Batter My Heart, Three-Person God. And it ends with these lines. Take me to you. Imprison me. For I, except you enthrall me, never shall be free, nor ever chaste, except you ravish me. That's what we need, friends, to break free from our slavery to other masters, to other loves, is that we would be enthralled by God, that we would celebrate him, that he would captivate our imaginations. Because, friends, we have the same special privilege that Israel did. We have the privilege of being God's holy people on the earth, rescued out of slavery to sin, brought into a covenantal relationship with God through Jesus. We've come to know the truth about who God is, how wonderful and loving and merciful and good he is. And his presence goes with us by the Holy Spirit. We're called to be God's light in the world. You know, there's no story better than that. And what a joy it is to know it. What a privilege to be part of it. What an honor to get to share it. So today, let's celebrate the story that God has brought us into. And let's continue to do that through our lives. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness to us, that you've delivered us. And God, I pray, Lord, that if there's any among us who have realize that they've been living into another story or celebrating another uh, story. God, would you bring us back in repentance to celebrate who you are and what you've done? God, it is the best story there is, and it is the true story. And so, God, we thank you for bringing us into it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Todd. And thanks again to all of you for joining us today. I hope you are able to head into your week with new challenges to tackle and new thoughts to wrestle with. I'm excited to see what Jesus has in store for us through the Lenten season this year. And as always, if you've got any questions or need prayer support, please reach out to the church. And if you're going to be around Calgary next weekend, why not come join us for an in-person service at one of our sites? We'd love to see you.
Until next week, we were Love, Rock Point.